This video is part of the first course in Modelling Analysis and Control and here we're going to focus on an introduction to frequency response. What is frequency response then and why is it useful? Frequency implies oscillation or sinusoids and so a frequency response is how does a system response vary when it is excited by sinusoids of different frequencies? And why might we do this? Well, it lends itself to insightful and powerful control design techniques, as you will see in the following videos. First then again, so what is frequency response? And you can see what we're doing here is we're saying, let's assume that I've got some form of sinusoidal signal going into a system. And what will happen is that once the transient effects have died down, you'll get a sinusoidal signal coming out of the system. And you'll see what I've done here. I've said, assume that the input sinusoid is d sine omega t, and the output sinusoid is d times a sine of omega t plus phi. So if you were to sketch this input and this output on the same plot, what do you notice? First thing, they both oscillate at the same frequency, and that's not much of a surprise. But the key things that you want to notice, the amplitudes are different. You'll see here in the output, I've added this constant a. So we have a different amplitude from the output to what we have from the input. And similarly, phase. You'll see the output has a slightly different phase to the input. So here's an example. So what can you see? The input signal is sine of 3t, and that's given by this red line here. And the output signal is a sine 3t plus phi, and that's given by this blue signal here. Now, what I've done is I've ignored the transients. If you look carefully, you'll see that during the transients, we've not settled just to a sinusoid. There's some other stuff going on. So let's ignore that. If we do that, what you'll see is asymptotically, we're going to get a fixed phase and gain. All right, we can actually work out what the gain is. So A, well, that distance there is going to be 2A. All right, and we can also see that there's a phase shift. There's the peak for the input and there's the peak for the output. And you'll see there's a difference in phase between those two signals. Now, what happens if we change the frequency? Now, this picture looks quite busy, but if I do it slowly, you'll see what's going on. So this red line here, OK, is this signal U of T equals sine 3T. And that goes with this output line here, blue. You'll see they've got the same frequency. Now, what do you notice? There's a particular gain and there's a particular phase for that output. Now, what happens if I have a different input signal? So the magenta curve is sine t. So if you follow that, you'll see it's also a sinusoid, but it's a much slower frequency sinusoid. So there it is, there's the magenta curve. So if my plot isn't perfect, and where's the corresponding output? Well, it's in black, and you'll see here is the corresponding output. And what you notice is interesting about this. Again, if you ignore transients, the amplitude is very, very different. So change the frequency, and you get a different amplitude, which is what we've written here. And if you look closely, you'll see you also get a different phase. So if you take a general system, G of S, and you compute the asymptotic time response for some signal u equals sine omega t, the output is going to be a sine omega t plus phi. And in general, you'll find that the amplitude a and the phase phi both depend upon frequency. So as you change frequency, you get a different amplitude and a different phase. So what then is frequency response? Frequency response is simply the information stored in these two variables, so a of omega and phi of omega. In other words, how do gain and phase vary as I change the frequency of the input to the system? Now, it is possible to estimate the gain and phase from time domain plots, and this is useful background, but given this isn't a quick overview video, I'm not going to bother with that. You can do that in slower time if you like. What we need to focus on now is how do I actually calculate the frequency response? And here you see, I'm going to say, from a transfer function. So if I know the transfer function of the system, G of S, so we're focusing on linear systems, how can I work out what is this A and what is this phi? 
Well, it so happens that there are some very simple formula. You can show that a is the modulus of g of j omega and phi is the argument of g of j omega. So you've got some very, very simple formula you can use to calculate the gain and the phase. Let's give some examples then. So we start with g of s equals 3 over s plus 2. And then what I'm doing is I'm simply replacing s by j omega. And you see, therefore, I get 3 over j omega plus 2. And then I look at my definitions, which I put at the top here. So the gain is the modulus of g of j omega. And the phase is the argument of g of j omega. And so you see, if I have a complex number, 3 over j omega plus 2, then the gain has got to be 3 over the square root of omega squared plus 4. And the phase is going to be 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 2. Now, assuming you know complex numbers, you probably think, yeah, that's straightforward. So here's a slightly more complicated example. I've got g equals s plus a over s plus b. And again, you'll see I've simply replaced the s by j omega. And so the gain is the modulus of j omega plus a over j omega plus b. And again, assuming you're familiar with your complex numbers, you can write that by inspection using Pythagoras. And similarly, if you want the argument, you can see it's the argument of the numerator minus the argument of the denominator. So here's another example, which we can do slightly more slowly. So the first thing I'm going to do is write g of j omega, which is going to be j omega plus 4 over j omega plus 1 times j omega plus 5. Now, if I want the gain, then the gain, or the modulus of g of j omega, is simply going to be the modulus of j omega plus 4 divided by the modulus of j omega plus 1 times the modulus of j omega plus 5. And hopefully you can see by inspection that's the square root of omega squared plus 16 over the square root of omega squared plus 1 times the square root of omega squared plus 25. And hopefully you see, yes, it's straightforward. And if I want the phase, so the argument of g of j omega is simply going to be the argument of j omega plus 4 minus the argument of j omega plus 1 minus the argument of j omega plus 5. And you can do each of those using an inverse term. Here's a slightly more challenging example. And this is just to basically say, do you know your complex numbers? And what you should know is the modulus of a, b, c is simply the modulus of a times the modulus of b times the modulus of c. And the argument of a, b, c is the argument of a plus the argument of b plus the argument of c. So if you know your complex numbers, you can see I can split this seemingly complicated function into five different complex numbers and just use the product rule and the addition rule with the arguments. What happens then if I have right half plane poles and zeros? Well, the phase of a right half plane factor is not always obvious by inspection. And so this is my recommendation. You don't have to do it, but it will help you avoid mistakes. If you have a right half plane factor, always do a sketch just to make sure you don't make a silly error. So here's an example. I've got g equals s minus 1, or g of j omega is j omega minus 1. And what I'm going to do so I'm going to do a sketch. Here's my argon diagram with real and imaginary. And I'm going to put this complex number. There it is, j omega minus 1. And the key thing is I can see the phase <coughs> is theta. And I can see which quadrant it's in. So if I want to get the phase, I can avoid silly mistakes by making sure I can see this argon diagram. So there's omega. And there's 1. So I can calculate phi. And what I can see is that theta equals 180 minus phi, which is 180 minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 1. So you see, by plotting the argon diagram, I can make sure I don't make any silly mistakes calculating the phase. Similarly, for this second example, I've got 3 minus j omega. So there's 3. Here's the point 3 minus j omega. So this distance is omega. This distance is 3. 
and there's my argument theta. So theta, oops, I don't know what happened there. Theta is clearly 10 to the minus 1, sorry, minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 3. Now you notice I've got very different formula here, haven't I, for these two complex numbers. One's got 180 in it and the other doesn't. What happens if I have a right half plane factor in the denominator? Well, this, you just need to remember, again, your complex number algebra, that the modulus of 1 over g is the same as 1 over the modulus of g. And the argument of 1 over g is the same as minus the argument of g. So if I have 1 over s minus 1, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back quickly. And I'm going to see I've already done j omega minus 1. Here it is. So let's write that down first. OK, so the argument of j omega minus 1 equals 180 minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 1. So that I did on the previous page. And therefore, the argument of 1 over j omega minus 1 is going to be minus 180 plus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 1. So that's the easiest way to do that. And similarly, for this example here, we did on the previous page that the argument of 3 minus j omega is minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 3. And therefore, the argument of 1 over 3 minus j omega must be plus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 3. I'm not doing the modulus because the modulus is a lot more straightforward just using Pythagoras. So here's an example. How would you find the gain and phase of this? So the first thing I would do is I would say the modulus of s plus 1 over, oh, I better put j omega and make it clear, over um, 3 minus j omega, 2 plus j omega, so I made that too tight, doesn't it? It's going to be the modulus of j omega plus 1 divided by the modulus of 3 minus j omega times 2 plus j omega. So for the gain, I simply split it into the different factors and multiply the modulus of each. And hopefully you can see by inspection, you're going to get the square root of omega squared plus 1 divided by the square root of 9 plus omega squared times 4 plus omega squared. So the modulus is relatively straightforward with these simple factors. What about the phase? Well, the phase of this is going to be the phase of s plus 1 minus the phase of 3 minus s minus the phase of 2 plus s. So you see how I simplify it first. I say, what are my factors? Are the factors in the denominator, sorry, the numerator, in which case I have a plus, or are they in the denominator, in which case I put a minus? And it's as simple as that, because now you can simply write the answers down by inspection. So I get 10 to the minus 1 of omega minus, and then what was the 3 minus s? It was minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega over 3. We did that on the previous page, and then minus 10 to the minus 1 omega over 2. Now you'll notice how I've been careful here to put brackets in this expression to make sure I get all my pluses and minuses and don't get things mixed up. What about quadratic factors then? In general terms, finding the gain and phase of quadratic factors by hand is messy, and I wouldn't tend to do this here, so I'm only going to mention it very, very quickly so you recognise it's messy and realise that's a topic in itself, best covered when you study resonance. Okay? And the big issue that you really have to worry about is the complex number changes quadrant as you change frequency. So the formula you need to use changes. So that's where you have to be very, very careful. So we'll give a simple example and then leave it at that. So here's a quadratic factor, s plus 1 squared plus 4, which you can write as j omega plus 1 squared plus 4. Now, first thing I'm going to do is, re is expand that out. And you see, what do I get? I get 5 minus omega squared plus 2j omega. So the real part is, is 5 minus omega squared and the imaginary part 2j omega. So what happens then if omega is less than the square root of 5? Then what you find is this real part is positive. 
So if omega is less than the square root of 5, the real part is positive, and if I do my argand diagram, it means I'm here. Okay, so I can use a simple formula to find the argument. So here you see I've written it down, 10 to the minus 1 of 2 omega over 5 minus omega squared, because 5 minus omega squared is positive. However, what happens if omega is bigger than the square root of 5? And now you'll see if I do my little argand diagram, my complex number is over here. Because now, 5 minus omega squared has become negative. So I've moved into a different quadrant, so I need a different formula. And you can see here, I've written a different formula down. So that's the danger with quadratic factors. The formula changes depending upon the frequency. So it's a bit painful to do by hand. General terms, in the long term, you probably want computers to do this for you because it's a lot easier. So I'm just illustrating here the MATLAB code. Here's the MATLAB code you can use. It's called BODE. I'm doing the long formula here by hand, so you can see there are the long formula if you want to write them out, and here are the answers you get using the long formula, and here are the answers you get using BODE. You can see they're the same. Okay? So in summary, we've introduced the concept of frequency response and shown how the gain and phase can be computed directly from a transfer function representation. And we've summarised at the end that you can use BODE if you want the numerical values, and in general terms, that's what you're going to do.